Welcome to Launchpad, the unique radio show and podcast that celebrates new book releases and the authors that created them. Now, let's take off with your host, Grace Salmon. This is Launchpad. Welcome to episode 17, where I could not be more excited than to host Hope Gibbs, Linda Rosen, Meredith R. Staddard, and Donna Norman Carbone. I have the pleasure of working with these women on our bookish road trip uh, adventure, and I just could not be more excited than for today's show. So on behalf of Mary Helen Sheriff, the author marketing coach, and myself, Grace Salmon, I'm so glad you're here. This is being taped in front of a live audience, so if you are watching this live, please feel free to leave comments, questions in the chat, and we'd love to get to them during our time together today. But without further ado, let's jump right in and introduce you to Hope Gibbs with her new novel, debut novel, Where the Grass Grows Blue, Donna Norman Carbone with her brand new first ever book called All That is Sacred, Linda Rosen with her book number three, The Emerald Necklace, and Meredith R. Stoddard with her book, The Thistle and Lion, which is fifth in her series of the Once and Future series. And while we were in the green room, we realized that we together had 16 books. So we've got lots to talk about today. Welcome to each of you. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Thanks. Thank you. It's really exciting to be here with you. And what I'd like to do is hope, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about Where the Grass Grows Blue. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, where the Grass Grows Blue just debuted uh, in May 16th. And it is one woman's journey to either accept her troubled past by embracing the power of forgiveness or risk losing a second chance at love in a small Kentucky town. It takes place in Kentucky. We start out in Atlanta. And my main protagonist, she gets a lot of shocking news in a span of a week. Her husband's affair, he leaves her, and her beloved grandmother passes away and leaves her her home. So you fast forward for the next uh, year, it's, it goes in the next year, and she's still struggling on how she can be a, a mother and a single mother at that. And she goes back to Kentucky to finally sell her grandmother's home. But going back, she's really got a lot of ghost back there. Uh, she had a dysfunctional family, uh, but she also had a lot of love in her life as well. And she's going to probably run into someone who was very important to her when she was uh, growing up. So it's about second chances of love, but more importantly, it's about forgiveness, forgiving yourself and forgiving others. Thank you. And it's got a beautiful cover. If you have a chance Thanks. to hold it up, it would be absolutely wonderful. Thank you. There it is. And we've got people watching us, and I, so I'd like to welcome them, uh, Linka Haney, Mary Helen Sheriff, Rebecca uh, Rosenberg, and a Facebook user. Um, please feel free to put your name in there. We don't always get to see it if you're not registered with StreamYard. So, Donna, tell us about All That Is Sacred. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my book, All That Is Sacred, here, Beautiful. Um, is about five girls who forged a bond when they were 15 years old in high school. And before they went off to college, they made a sacred promise to be forever friends. But through college and their young adult years, their friendship becomes fractured until one of them dies in a tragic car accident. And that is my main character, Lynn, who ascends to a peaceful heaven and she's yanked back to the in-between when she hears her husband call the out to her. And she feels like her friends are the the um, hinge pin to um, keep her, her family afloat. Um, and so she calls her friends to a cottage, a familiar cottage, to um, help them heal the fractures in their own bonds so they can help her family heal. And what she doesn't realize is that if they do, she has to find a way to let them go. So um, my book is written on a non-linear timeline. And it has lots of memories and laughter and lots of 1980s nostalgia. Indeed. And I've had the privilege of reading each of your books. So I'm very excited about that. Linda, you know a little bit about fractured families in your new novel as well. Tell us about the Emerald Necklace. Okay, here's the Emerald Necklace. Oh, okay, that just came out on May 11th. Um, it's set in 1969 to 71 when women were fighting for equality. And we've got Rosalie, who's an insecure sculptor, 
and Fran, a best-selling novelist, and they've got their own issues. There's a lot of bitter envy between the two of them, deep-held, long-held secrets. And then we enter Jill, Rosalie's granddaughter, with her heirloom emerald necklace, which could possibly bind them together or could really toss them all apart. So we've got friendship and frenemies and women's rights and reproductive rights and envy and jealousy and all in a little novel that today, May 18th, since we're live today, today until the 21st, you can get the ebook, the Kindle, only the Kindle for 99 cents. But that's if you're listening today. <laughs> <laughs> that's fabulous. And now, Meredith R. Stoddard, I have not had the chance to read Thistle and Lion, but I am in love with the beginning of your series. So tell us where we are. Um, well, we are on book five, and um, my Once in Future series blends Celtic legends with modern life. Um, we follow Sarah McAlpin, who's a folklorist, um, and she is trying to trace a song that her grandmother taught her and gets embroiled in some um, political intrigue, some corporate intrigue, and um, a lot of family secrets. So we're on book five, Thistle and Lion, and it's coming out June 8th, so all I have is a proof copy. Um, but uh, And this one is um, a little bit of uh, Rebecca meets Succession. There is this sort of new wife, fish out of water kind of storyline but also a lot of corporate intrigue within Alba Petroleum, which is the oil company that um, it talks about in this series. So um, I'm very excited about book five. Book one, by the way, The River Maiden is also free on most ebook platforms. So if anybody is interested in trying the series, they can do that very easily. That's amazing. I'm so glad you shared that with our listeners because that is the book I am most familiar with. And I think when I opened it, I read the first line and texted you right away and said you had me at hello. <laughs> so I'm, I'm so glad uh, that all of this success is here. You know, we've talked a lot on different platforms and amongst ourselves about our real love of writing. Don, I want to go back to you. You equate it to breathing. Yeah, I do. <laughs> it's necessary. I can't imagine my life without writing. I really can't. I, my earliest memories are writing. My my mother has a picture of me at, I think, age four sitting down writing. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's something I do all the time. I do it to, you know, work through things in my own life and understand life and, and also like the pleasure side of it, just being creative and creating whole worlds and characters. Meredith, I love that you um, always talk about you knew you were a storyteller from the time you were sitting at your grandmother's table. Tell us more. Oh, well, um, I am lucky enough to have an amazing grandmother. She was born in 1917 and um, loves to tell stories. And she is sort of uh, my family is from a very small town in North Carolina, and she is kind of the memory keeper now for multiple generations and loves to share stories and tell stories. So I have grown up sitting across her kitchen table, just listening to all the various legends of, you know, our little town. So, um, so, so let's do the math for those of us who are fingers and toes. She is 105 and right now. Yeah. And still has the memories. Um, yeah. Yeah. And they, I'm hearing a lot of repeated stories. <laughs> They're her greatest hits, but yeah, she is. Um, she's doing amazing for being 105. Well, well, we're so glad you share her with us. Hope, it's sort of the same question because I don't. I think I heard an interview where you said you didn't know you were going to be a writer. Tell us more. I didn't set out to be a writer. Uh, I had been a stay-at-home mom for about two decades, and I have five children. And I realized that my kids were getting ready to leave, to go to college. And a few years ago, a friend said, well, why don't you start journaling, you know, to try to help you figure out what you're going to do with your next chapter of your life. And I realized I didn't like journaling and I had started creating a character. And before I knew it, um, that one chapter turned into 28 chapters and a book. So are you now a writer? I think so. So I, I always say my mother was the writer in, in our family, and she was, and I wish she could have been here to see this, but um, I always wanted to be a writer. I just don't think I believed in myself. Well, 
You certainly should. You've gotten great reviews, and we're excited for all of these launches. Linda, I know that you came to writing a little bit late. I did. I never really thought I was going to write a novel. I always dreamt about it because I was very active in book clubs, and I loved when we would have an author come to our book club. And I just thought how fabulous that would be to have people curled up with a cup of tea reading a book that I wrote. You know, I just thought that was the greatest dream. But it wasn't until I was entering my 60s that I actually took a step into writing. And once I took that step or put my fingers on the keyboard, they haven't stopped. <laughs> they, they, they certainly haven't. And so I guess I'd like to go back to um, your, your stories of plot. How did you develop the different plots? You're all in different places. You know, Meredith is in a series. Linda, let's start there with you, because I think you're inspired or intrigued by an event, and then the book comes. Talk about that. Well, the first thing I have to do is think about which piece of jewelry I'm going to be writing now that I realize that I have to have jewelry in each of my books. So that was the th one thing that I came up with a piece of jewelry and it. I, if you read the interview with Mary Helen Sheriff, that's on our bookish road trip uh, website, you'll find out, I don't want to take all the time up about that piece of jewelry, which became an emerald necklace in there, but there was a personal story with my mother with that piece of jewelry. So I had some kind of a secret in there, but then I was doing some research to find out what else went on in 69, 70. I mean, I lived that time, but I didn't want to write about Vietnam or civil rights or you know any of the other stuff that was going on. And I found this women's strike for equality. And that period of time, it was really women's lib or the second phase of feminism. And I, it, it just grabbed me. So I knew that I would have something to do with women's rights in the book. But that's just part of the book. It's really more the envy of the characters. And I don't know what comes to me. <laughs> you know? When you develop your characters, I give them a whole bio and figure it out from there. Donna, what about you? I all, Well, I, I have two books. So I have one coming out in June and then another one coming out next year. And I think um, for me, it starts with something, an experience that I have. And then it just kind of morphs into this otherworldly idea that is like a springboard from the experience. So all that is sacred um, is inspired by a real life event. Um, a friend of mine passed away tragically in a car accident and um, her sister reached out to me to write something because they were going to put together a book for her daughters. And a year before that, I had gone to a medium with a friend of mine who was hoping to be read. And I said, sure, I'll go, you know, that'll be fun. And I was read instead. And the reading was um, to reconnect with my childhood friends because we were going to need each other. And so those two things just kept ruminating and I felt like I needed to write a book out of friendship. So um, with my second novel, it really started as uh, I read an article and I was just fascinated by the topic of the article. And so I just kind of took it in a whole different direction. I didn't know you had a second book, so we'll have to celebrate next you year. again when it comes out next yeah. year. Hope, how did the theme come to you or the plot? Well, again, I started journaling and kind of stumbled into it, but I, I was writing for about two months and I really didn't have anything. And I was in church of all places and our minister mentioned the name Bob Dylan. And of course, you don't normally hear him on a Sunday morning. And of course, I perked up a little bit. And then he mentioned a song that I had never heard of called Tangled Up in Blue. And I felt like I had been struck by lightning because then I knew where this character, Penny, I knew her story for some reason, and it just came together. And I started listening to music, which was great for me. It really inspired me. And that's really how I got from just journaling and creating this character to really figuring out her life. She is tangled up in blue. And for a while, that was the title uh, up until last summer when I had to change it to uh, where the grass grows blue. But it was in church of all places where I got my inspiration comes to us in many places. Meredith, in the series. Um, well, you know, 
it's sort of fed by all of the things like when I was in college, I studied folklore and it's fed by kind of all the folklore that I've absorbed over the years. Um, but what really inspired this book is the idea uh, or the series is the idea that if King Arthur is the once and future king, what would happen if the future part of that was now? So um, we're picking up in the 1990s with a modern woman who learns that she is supposed to be the mother of the second coming of King Arthur and um, what that does to a modern person's life, which it kind of blows it up. So, um, so that's kind of where that, qu that question was sort of my jumping off point. Isn't it amazing how different we are, but we still wind up with these amazing novels. We do have people who have visited with us, um, some new names for us and some old friends. So thank you for being there with us. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the chat. Um, what was the biggest surprise? Hope, let's start with you. What's the biggest surprise in your writing process? I think the biggest surprise wasn't just necessarily the writing process. It was after and meeting other writers and authors. I cannot tell you how wonderful, how generous they are. It has been an incredible experience. And I have made some very dear friends through this and people that, although some of them I have not met in person, I call them, you know, multiple times, the, you know, during the week and, and ask for, you know, help or advice. And I would just say my biggest surprise was making so many connections and wonderful friends. Okay, Linda. I would just say ditto to that. Ab absolutely, it's the community of, of writers. But I'm looking at some of the comments, if I can just take a moment. Please. Because uh, Rebecca Rosenberg was, I don't see it now, but she said something like she was glad to know that the emerald necklace uh, came from two real stories. No, only one real story, the strike for equality, nothing else in the book other than the, that a piece of an emerald does show up in any real story. So I don't want you to think that that was my life when you read the book. Please don't think it's my life. So I'm going to skip around, even though we had a question on the floor. We have questions from our listeners, which I'd much prefer to get to. Laika, Lika, and I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Who has been your hardest character to write about and why? Who would like to field that? Donna. Hmm. That's, I'm thinking that we, that's a great question. The hardest character to write about. Well, probably my main character, because I've never, she is in heaven for, or in limbo for most of the book and I've never been there. So I had to <laughs> hate this whole world um, and just imagine what it would have been like and, and what she would, you know, what kind of special powers do you have in heaven that you don't have on earth? And so that was, you know, that was difficult, challenging, fun. <laughs> All of the things. <laughs> All of the above. Meredith, because you you go back and forth in time. What was the most um, I do. Character? And I have some interesting characters. I think probably the hardest uh, was Molly McAlpin, which is Sarah's mother. Um, and uh Part of Sarah's challenge in life is that her mother uh, dies when she's very young and um, suffered from a lot of mental illness like while she was alive. And Sarah's kind of dealing with the repercussions of that. And it was very hard to kind of get into the mind of uh, Molly, and which is what I do in the second book in the series where you get to hear kind of her story and what happened to her that kind of sparked all of this trauma for her. And so that was a really, really difficult character to write. But um, I managed to pick, to find one song and, um, and you guys can talk about this as well because it, I think it happens a lot for us writers. There's like that one thing that unlocks it for you and gives you that character's voice. And then, you know, it just kind of flows. Fascinating, Hope. Well, I agree with the song when that one, just a lyric sometimes can change everything. Um, I was listening to a song that I, I had heard a million times. It was on my iPhone and it was uh, by the Goo Goo Dolls and it was called Name. And there is a, a just a random line that says, scars or souvenirs you never lose. The past is never far. And that really gave me an idea for Penny's life. And so I just kind of ran with it. And so 
I would say that my hardest character was also my easiest. It was Penny because sometimes it was hard because she really does have a lot of issues in her childhood that are, are kind of hard and they can be triggering for people. Um, so that was a little hard, but I also, I felt like I knew her. So in one way, she was my hardest and the other way, she was also my easiest. Linda. It's interesting. Somebody asked me that question recently also. And my answer was, none of them were really difficult for me to write. Um, I think the issues in the book were more my difficult part, the, especially the issues of abortion in the book. And I had to be, I really had, I mean, I didn't have trouble with it, but I wanted to make sure that I was giving all the characters and everybody all the different viewpoints on it. So if, if there was a, one that I could say was hard, it might be Fran because of what she went through. Um, but I've never been through what Fran went through and I've never been through what Rosalie went through. It's imagination is wonderful, but it's also life experiences and being with, you know, people and hearing their stories that go into the characters we form. You alluded to research, and um, I have to tell you, I now consider Meredith R. Stoddard the queen of all things research. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll do a little uh, blurb in the, here we are in the middle of the episode, but um, this, tele, this radio series really prompted the idea of creating a series of writing. So the first book we came out with was Launchpad, The Countdown to Writing Your Book. The Launchpad, The Countdown to Publishing Your Book is already out. And in June, Mary Helen Sheriff and I are launching Launchpad, The Countdown to Marketing Your Book. And I would tell you one of uh, the chapters that taught me the most in this was on research. Linda also has a fabulous chapter in this one on the importance of community, and we've touched on that. But Meredith, I really do think you are the queen of research. Oh, How much research you. did you have to do to become the queen of research? Um, I don't know. I think you just have to be a really curious person. And um, I'm a person who likes to know the answers to things. So if, if a question pops up in my head, I'm going to find out you know, who it is and, or what it is. And so um, fortunately we have the internet uh, and a lot of opportunity for research at the, you know, right at our uh, fingertips, but you just have to make sure that uh, you're researching it and you're looking, you're finding accurate information, which is one of the things that I talk about in that chapter is avoiding misinformation. Or if you're researching for fiction, you can dive into misinformation. I have conspiracy theories all over my books, but you just have to know that it's misinformation and, um, you know, be able to identify what's true and what's not. Where are the rest of you on research? Because we run, Linda, you write, you know, not quite historical, but somewhat historical fiction. And the other two are much more contemporary. How much research do you each have to do? I do a great deal of research, but I absolutely love research like Meredith. I, I mean, I hated doing it in high school or college, but now <laughs> I love it. And Meredith's chapter in, um, Launchpad is a fantastic chapter. Even having done a lot of research for my three books, I still learned a great deal from that chapter. I do. I really like doing research. Um, I learn more now from either reading historical fiction or researching for my own books on topics that I never learned in school. So <laughs> I like that I, I'm still learning. Yeah. And I love that. I never want to stop being yeah. curious and learning. I think that's, you know, something but I will that's say essential that, to being a writer. Absolutely. And the research, yeah, we've got the internet, which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I could possibly be doing as much research if I keep going back to a library. I love it at my fingertips. But I also love the research when I put my feet in the period, in, in the place. And I can only do that because I write back and play in this in 20th century or 21st century. Within no, my actually, life, within Linda's and my lifetimes, not in, not in terms of everybody no, else's. in my lifetime. I'm writing something now uh, earlier than my lifetime, but I can still go to those streets. I'm not writing about 1600s. Okay. You know? Donna and then Hope on research. Sure. Um, I, you know, even though my book is more contemporary, I did a lot of research and I, like Meredith and Linda, love it as well. Um, I'm constantly like opening tabs on my 
on my internet while I'm writing. Um, even when I, when I decide on the setting of a book, I really try to immerse myself in that, especially if I haven't been somewhere. So in terms of setting, like I do a lot of research on, on my settings because I want to get it right. So I really want to feel. So I, you know, look up, um, you know, destinations to go to. I even look up like Zillow, the house market. Um, so I'm constantly researching, even if even if it isn't historical. My second book is historical, and I did considerably more research for that. Um, but this one, I still did a lot. Okay, thank you. Hope. Well, for Where the Grass Grows Blue, yes, it is contemporary, but it also has flashbacks to the 1970s and 80s. And so I wanted to make sure if I had any pop culture references that I was actually in the right year, the right month. Um, you know, basically, I, I knew Kentucky. I grew up there. I know the food. I know how people talk. So that wasn't as big of a deal for me. But with my second book, it was more just making sure that, you know, was that restaurant open at that time of the year? But my third book is going to take place in 1973, Kentucky. And it's all about, you know, raising a, a, a crop of tobacco. And so for me, I'm doing a lot of research right now, just making sure that, you know, that I'm doing it authentically. So, um, so yeah, so I, I did have to do some research with all three. I didn't know you had three. I'm impressed. Well, trying. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, one of the things I joked with Donna about uh, when I was reading her book, All That Is Sacred, was uh, her main character uh, has a little bit of a control issue, I think. You know, she <laughs> she wants to control what happens once, once people pass, uh, mm -hmm. which I love because I am an admittedly a control freak. We had a question earlier about how much control do you have of your cover? And I'm just going to expand that to how much control do you have of that entire writing process. Meredith, let's start with you. Um, well, I'm t completely independent, so I control everything. I set my own deadlines. I design my own covers. I format the inside. I'm doing it all myself. Um, so, I, and I like that. I like that it gives me a lot of control. I like that I can write a series of books, and I don't have somebody saying you have to make it a trilogy or make it YA because no adult woman wants to read fantasy, which is completely untrue. Um, and so, I like I like having that control. Um, but, uh, you know, everybody's experience is different and I, you know, and everybody, uh, benefits from things differently. So the, the range of experiences, I agree. Hope. Um, so I had some input my, with my publisher, you know, I, I am with a small press. They still have the final say on everything, but I did get to put uh, quite a bit of input on my cover. I was very adamant that there be flowers, especially uh, these blue hydrangeas, because they're part of the story and they're really part of Penny's past, her present, her future. And so um, I did get to have some say, but not complete control. And Donna, you are at the same press, I believe, as Hope, Red Adept. Yeah, um, I am. And my experience was the same. They actually sent out like a, a kind of like a wish list and asked us what we would like to see on our cover. And and when the first proof came back, the only thing that I didn't like was the um, font that they had chosen. And so they chose a completely new font. I, you know, they, they definitely listened to my recommendations and the two things, the two objects that are on my cover, which is a friendship bracelet and an empty bottle, both are symbols in the story as well and beautiful they are. Linda, you've had two different, very different experience or three different experiences. Well, I have um, on my first two books, the, I'm also with a small press and they designed the cover and I had a lot of input. Of course, it's their final say, but I had a great deal of input on it. Um, really a lot of input. Uh, but my third book, I went rogue and they allowed me to have somebody else design it. And I got my niece, who was a creative director at an ad agency, who we worked hand in hand. Um, the publisher had to agree to it or put their own little twist on it if they wanted, but they wound up not doing anything to it. So Wonderful. I guess I had total control or 99% control on this on the third book. I have to tell you, this is such a joy to have had Hope Gibbs with Where the Grass Grows Blue. Hold that up one more time. Okay. Linda Rosen with The Emerald Necklace. 
Donna Norman Carbone with All That Is Sacred, and Meredith R. Staddard with Thistle and Lion. An honor to work with you ladies every single day. And thank you to everybody here for being on Launchpad. I hope you've fallen in love with these authors and found your next great read. Thanks for being with us here on Launchpad. Thanks, Grace. Thanks, Grace. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everyone. This episode is copyrighted by Grace Salmon and Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. Thank you for visiting with us on Launchpad.